Hello, everybody. Uh, glad to see everybody here. And it looks like it, the topic is very important since the hall is almost crowded. And we'll be talking within the next 75 minutes about the very important issue that uh, almost all investigative reporters are dealing with. We will be talking about the uh, uncovering assets throughout the world. Uh, it's actually important uh, from the point of uh, the documents that uh, investigative reporters can reach uh, and get during their research. I have a question so we would understand better which, which audience do we have. Please raise your hand uh, who has experience over more than five years of recovering assets. Okay, please raise your hands uh, who never did it. Okay, so that's, that's for our speakers. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. and uh, uh, as, as we are uh, going to do through the presentations of our uh, speakers, uh, the set of the work will be uh, following. I'm introducing you, I want to introduce you, Lara. And uh, she will, Laura Dimis, uh, she works for OCCRP, she will tell a little more about herself. And she will be the first speaker and then we will have the speaker, Jan Casewell, uh, from the Means Group. This is the uh, company that actually is focused uh, or targeting the uh, issues that we are going to discuss. And then we will have the time for the question and answers. So, Lara, please do your presentation. Do you, who are you? Tell about some words <laughs> about yourself and then we'll ask to do Again. the same, Jan, and then we'll go on. Yeah, so, um, yeah, my name is Lara Dimas. I work for the OCCRP on, um, on its investigative dashboard, which is a platform uh, for our member centers and network where we kind of help with um, research requests and tracking assets. I was focused more on like the Middle East and North Africa, so that's kind of my bit of an introduction. Thank you. Yeah. Um, hi, yeah, I'm a, well, now I'm a corporate investigator with the Mintz Group, and uh, I have a past life uh, working for law enforcement um, for the UK government's asset recovery agency, and prior to that I was at Europol, primarily investigating Eastern European organized crime and financial crime. You may be asking why I'm here as a non-investigative journalist. Um, so Jim Mintz, who I think might be in the audience, that's the name above our door, There's, there he is. He's probably hiding, sorry Jim. He'll take autographs at the end after. Um, and um, Jim's heritage is in investigative journalism, then set up the Mintz Group. I think we approach things very much like yourselves, digging into wrongdoing and shining a light on the murky areas of the world in which we live. Um, and Jim has a close uh, affiliation with, with your network, having a, uh, a non-profit called DigLab that does a lot of um, training of investigative journalists and citizens that want to dig into wrongdoing. So that's why I'm here. So thank you. Yeah, thank you, Jan. And uh, discussing how we will start, we consider that uh, it would be good to start with the kind of uh, broad overview and some basics about the uh, tracking assets that uh, Lara will do, and then we will go to Jan with more theoretical and in-depth uh, stuff regarding the assets and uh, uh, tracking the, this uh, stuff throughout the world. So Lara, go ahead, please. <clears throat> yeah, so um, as Oleg said, I'm gonna be talking from kind of more of a journalistic and research lens, um, and we're basically gonna be going over some techni techniques, tools, and methods, and then I'll give some case studies on how we apply these in some of our stories and projects. So kind of the first thing I wanted to do was break kind of asset tracking down into kind of two starting points that, um, that I often kind of, myself, kind of find myself starting from. Um, obviously, as I said, I work for the investigative dashboard, so it means we're getting requests from reporters within our network um, who need research assistance. So whether that's kind of identifying relatives of an individual um, they're looking at or whether it's figuring out, figuring out who's behind a company um, or an address or who owns a plane or whatever it is. Um, within that, I kind of generally find myself starting from one of two points. So it's either, as it says, looking for things that a certain individual or their associates own or it's looking um, for who owns a certain asset. So you'll have an asset and you wanna know, obviously, who, who owns it. Um, 
So these starting points obviously can be brought on in, in different ways. Um, so it could be that you're just trying to find out where someone is storing their wealth, or it might be that you have a tip that someone is storing their wealth in a certain way, and then you kind of go from there. So obviously, once you're at one of those two starting points, um, there are some things you would kind of want to be familiar with to kind of start the process. These are not like, you don't have to know, you know, these in detail, but this is just kind of, um, you know, an overview. So the first thing is, and I think Ian's going to talk more about this in his presentation, um, if you do have a person of interest that you're looking into their assets or, you know, you're trying to find, you know, where they're hiding all of their companies or whatever it is, um, you're going to want to kind of, or it will make it easier if you do familiarize yourself with, you know, their relatives and associates of their, you know, of their network and, and um, so yeah, identifying their network um, and who might be holding assets kind of on their behalf if they're trying to evade detection or whatever it is. So that's kind of the first thing. Um, the second thing, which we'll kind of go over in more detail in the next slide, is kind of having an understanding of what sources of information you're able to get in different jurisdictions. Obviously, I'm not saying that you need to know kind of exactly what you can get in every single country in the world, but kind of having a general idea really does help, um, and we'll explain, we'll talk about that a bit more now. So the third thing is familiarizing yourself with different types of assets. Obviously, assets do come in all shapes and sizes, and you can pretty much put your money anywhere these days um, if you have enough of it. So um, kind of knowing that there are no bounds and that you do sometimes need to get a bit creative in kind of searching for assets, and there's a, an example we'll go over which kind of illustrates that. And then the last thing is just kind of a broad understanding of what to look out for in company records. And that's, again, kind of a crucial point because when you're asset tracking and following the money, obviously, it's pretty likely that whatever documents you do get, you're gonna wanna go through them and you're gonna wanna see what's, what's kind of in them. So just kind of having an idea of what you're kind of looking for or what, you know, where the sort of relevant information you would need to get is in these documents, obviously that's quite important. Um, so yeah, the next slide is like, basically I just wanted to go over kind of the key sources of information that we often find ourselves drawing from and when we are trying to uncover who's behind an asset or what a person owns. And I've just kind of broken it down into four general categories. Obviously, there, you know, this isn't kind of be all end all, but this is kind of a general overview. So obviously, the first is public records, which many of you may be familiar with anyway. But it basically refers to um, anything you can find in the public domain. So this obviously includes the most obvious thing, which is business registries, where people, um, you know, register and file information about their companies. It can also refer to gazettes, which are also publicly available. And depending on the country, this is sometimes the most valuable kind of way of finding information, especially like if you think about Iran, their Gazette is pretty, it's actually pretty good, and Syria as well. Um, other kind of public records would be court records or property ownership registries, and obviously that kind of what, what is available in these, in these registries or whether they're available obviously depends on where you're looking. So if we're talking about company registries, if you're looking at a UK company, obviously, company's house is quite good in the sense that you're gonna get information on directors and shareholders. You're probably gonna get annual reports and you can, you know, it's quite good in terms of the fact that you can search by a person or by a company name or whatever it is. Whereas if I'm trying to find the UBO of a, of a UAE company, I mean, that's obviously a whole other thing. Um, you know, depending on what free zone it is and all of that stuff, it's just not as straightforward and the same with the BVI and those kind of jurisdictions. So, but, if we are talking about UAE companies, um, that's where like other public records can come in handy. So I'm not sure if many of you know this, but UAE court records are actually really searchable. If you go to the judicial website, you can search by key term. So that's something I often do is if I'm stuck on a UAE company, I'll go into the judicial um, registry and kind of search the company name. And obviously if that company has been taken to court or if you know its owner has, um, they'll be listed on the record. So it's kind of a good workaround and it's obviously still official in its public records. Um, and so obviously within these public sources, it's really important to know how to navigate business registries and other sources of public information in countries other than your own, because obviously nowadays, you know, you can put your money anywhere and uh, globalization and all that stuff. So um, for example, if you're a reporter in Lebanon, and you're interested in finding whatever businessman X, you know, where he's storing his wealth, 
it's unlikely, obviously, that your investigation is going to end in Lebanon. You know, you're likely going to come across companies or addresses or whatever it is offshore, and you're going to want to know how to keep following the network elsewhere. So it's obviously um, really important as well because if you have a, if you're looking at a company that's registered in a really secretive jurisdiction, that maybe they don't require you to file any information. It might have done business with, you know, a more transparent jurisdiction, or it might have subsidiaries there where they're kind of forced to file their UBO. So that way, it's, again, you can kind of go through that way and, um, and find out who's behind the company. So paid databases, I don't wanna to go too much into, but this basically just refers to tools that kind of make our lives easier. You know, they kind of scrape company registries, they scrape property registries, and that means that in cases where, you know, sometimes you can't search a registry by a person's name or whatever it is, they've got this, got this information scraped and indexed, and you can just kind of go and search by person's name, company name, identifier, whatever it is. Um, other, this obviously applies to like people databases as well, um, you know, um, website domain tools, which basically, anyway, we're not going to go into that. Um, the third thing, which is probably my, my favorite, is obviously the open source sleuthing. Um, and I mean, this obviously does kind of cover public records, public sources in a way. But what I mean here is kind of like the classic Google dorking, you know, exhausting all avenues of research. Um, you know, on the internet and just kind of scanning and analyzing social media accounts and that kind of thing. Um, and this will kind of relate to my first example, which we're gonna go into in a second and how sometimes that could actually be enough to find um, a really interesting asset. I just really quickly wanted to show OCCRP um, the investigative dashboards catalog of resources. It's a really good resource that I use in my day to day. Um, it's basically, we've kind of just taken all the public links to all the links to public sources that you can get in as many countries as we could find, and as many countries as there are. And um, you know, if you're <laughs> so, if you're obviously trying to find out what you can get in terms of company information in Luxembourg, you can just kind of filter it and go to Luxembourg, and we've got links to you know the registry and all of that stuff. And we've tried to do it. Obviously, there are some broken links, or we might not have got something that's you know, available in your country, so you can always reach out to us and tell us what we've missed on there. I just really, again, quickly wanted to go over Aleph and um, ICIJ's offshore leaks. So um, Aleph is a kind of free tool that we at OCCRP have kind of, we use on a daily basis. And it basically has just scraped like a bunch of different random webs websites and registries and it's just got a whole host of information like trillion not trillions maybe, maybe trillions but millions of documents at least um and kind of you just never know what you're going to find in there and one of the examples again will show like how this can really be useful the second one is obviously offshore leaks which many of you may be familiar with but it has over 800,000 um offshore companies and details that are from the icij um the icij investigations so this is just qu really quickly some of the things um, Aleph can offer. So if you see on the left, it's got leaks, it's got company registries, it's got financial records, it's got land registry information, it's got sanctions listings, it's got all of this kind of stuff. So when you are you know, tracking assets or trying to find whatever it is related to a person or a company or whatever it is, you can kind of just go in there and it's also just made some really difficult registries um, easily searchable. So the first kind of really brief example I wanted to give was that when you do have databases like these, finding an asset can be as simple as literally just exploring what has been made available in this database. So Aleph has um, scraped ownership information on for foreign companies that own property in the UK. So you can literally just go in, you can create an account and mess about with it and just search for a person of interest and see if any of their companies own properties here. So here I really briefly gave an example of Riyad Salame, who's Lebanon's central bank governor, who we've kind of done several investigations on uncovering his offshore wealth. And, you know, we search his name here, and basically his association with the Luxembourg registered Fullwood comes up. We kind of search that into the overseas um, property registry, and we get like a list of addresses that are owned by that, proper, that company, which is owned by him. So it's just, you know, so at least seven properties are in there based on that. Anyway, so now I'm gonna go through kind of the proper examples, um, which I'm really hoping will illustrate how, you know, whatever information or asset you're looking for, it's, it's probably out there, but just kind of sometimes you have to get a bit creative in trying to, uh, trying to, uh, trying to find it. 
So, actually, before I get to that. So these three examples that I'm going to give all come from OCCRP's Russian Asset Tracker project, which we um, basically just in short terms, we set out to track down, um, like identify and catalog different assets and the wealth of you know, oligarchs and key fig figures who are close to the Kremlin. So we did like a whole database and we made it publicly accessible and it was based on you know, official records and it was based on you know, official documentation and we wanted to just make it like a catalog that people could go to and explore and, and see that you know, their wealth is everywhere. So um, this example is Abramovich. Uh, it's actually the horses of Sofia Abramovich, which is Roman Abramovich's daughter. Um, so as I said earlier, you know, there are several starting points from which we can set out to identify and then dig into assets. And our search for these uh, horses actually all began with a tip, which we, we received after we published our first round of, um, of assets. And um, we basically called on readers to send us any information or tips or leads they might have on, on any kind of you know, oligarch associations. And um, in this case, we got this tip that was Sofia Abramovich has show jumpers each worth over $500,000. Um, so we obviously received this and none of us are like show jumper <laughs> experts. Like we've, you know, investigated yachts and we've, we can figure out ownerships of planes and, and companies and so on, but we've never really explored like show jumpers. Um, so we basically just started with like basics of kind of, you know, open source sleuthing, which is just start with Google. Um, we did kind of the, this might be a bit basic, but we kind of just, you know, did the search operators, kind of tried to get a bit creative. This is a, this will be on the presentation. If any of you are interested later, you can refer back to it. It's just different types of examples that we could have done in our searches. And then we basically just kept exploring, just literally trying different things. And we eventually came across this website that kind of started to look a bit legitimate. Um, and it had like a date of birth that, you know, again, made it seem like it's, it's probably some sort of official registry. We then started deploying our search operators. So we did a site search and saw that there were several results. So Sofia Abramovich was coming up a lot on this website. And we ended up just clicking through exploring and we found this FEI database. So it's like the federal equestrian, whatever it is. And um, you could also not only search by the name of a horse, but you could also search by the name of a person, which was obviously really good for us. And we did the Abramovich surname and we found, you know, Irina, so uh, Abramovich's ex-wife, we had her, his two daughters and it said that, you know, there was ownership involved. We just kept exploring. We searched Sofia Abramovich's name and found like a list of horses that were associated with her. Um, and obviously, you know, found that they were, um, they were the owners. And also interesting is that they started, they had re-registered some of these horses, as you can see on the left. They'd re-registered them in, I think, the build-up to the, to the Russian in in invasion of Ukraine. So, you know, it had gone from the ex-wives to, to uh, Sofia, which is obviously quite interesting. And then we started, because these horses, I mean, I don't know if you saw, but they have really strange, like, official names. So we had to kind of cross-reference with other sources, like, how do we, you know, how can we confirm that these are definitely their horses? Um, and we just started going through their Instagram pages and seeing that they were posting about, so one of them was called Valkyrie Desants, and we had seen that she had kind of on the Abramovich Stables Instagram had posted a listing, which basically the horse goes by Percy. So that's how we were able to kind of confirm that. And yeah, Percy was all over Sophia's Instagram page and as were her other horses. And this is basically what we ended up with. We ended up finding, I'm not sure how many that is, about, yeah, 30 or so horses that obviously these horses are like not just any regular horse, they're like professional athletic show jumpers, they're worth like hundreds of thousands of dollars. Not only that, but their kind of offspring would be worth that too, so they can kind of get into that business. Okay, so the next example, so that kind of was more of an example of like open sources, kind of how you can sometimes you know, happen upon an asset. This example is more about how we kind of relied on um, public records, different registries that I kind of had discussed earlier. So we had actually come across this apartment while trying to confirm a different New York apartment, um, which we knew was owned by Eugene Schwidler, you know, another Russian oligarch, and he's actually a close friend of um, Roman Abramovich. So we searched 
the surname Schwidler in the New York um, property registry, which is like accessible and it's one of the few that you can actually search by a person's name, which is obviously really useful for us. Um, and we ended up coming across this property in the name of someone called Daniel Schwidler. So it's like the first one. So obviously from there we had to figure out, okay, who is Daniel? Um, so what did we do? <laughs> Back to Google. We, oh no, wait, this, <laughs> this was the address. So this was the property record. Um, so we started with a Google search and we were, you know, just Daniel Schwidler. And we came across this picture of Daniel Schwidler, you can see like down here. And um, it was basically in a press release um, about a donation from Eugene Schwidler. So that was kind of the first indication that yes, this is likely someone associated with Eugene. Um, this was the kind of specific part. So what did we do? We took his face from this picture and we reverse image searched it in one of our paid tools. So this is a really powerful tool. It basically, if you put an image in, it will cross-reference it against images across the internet. And we basically just put his, put his face in and we got some hits on him standing next to Abramovich. And then actually you can, kind of, I think that's Eugene under him. So he was with Abramovich and Eugene, his, his father. We then compared the two pictures. I mean, at that point, we, you can kind of see that they're the same person, but we did it anyway. And yes, we got a confirmation that they are the same, um, they are the same person. So at that point, we had confirmed that the Daniel Schwidler associated with the, I'm just gonna go back a slide, with the, um, at that point, we did, we'd confirmed that the Daniel Schwidler associated with the Eugene Schwidler donation press release has also been spotted with Abramovich and Eugene Schwidler. But what we really needed to find out next was proof that the Daniel Schwidler that owns the property is the Daniel Schwidler that is Eugene's son, right? Because there might be another Daniel Schwidler who owns a very expensive New York property. So what we did was we turned to another paid database called Property Shark, um, and this one is regionally specific, like it is only for US properties, and we just searched the, search the name, so Schwidler, um, and we noticed that the Bond Street address, which was the, the address we were looking at, so the second address, was associated with, a, you know, had a voter's record scrape of someone called Magen, Magen Schwidler. So, um, obviously we suspected that this was his daughter, so that would be Daniel's sister, but she didn't really have much of a presence online, we'd done the social media stalking, we hadn't really, you know, found anything. But this is where Lef really comes in handy. Um, we were kind of trying to figure out uh, who Magan was and um, ended up finding this random email in Aleph from like one of the leaked um, databases. Uh, it was dated August 2011 and it was of an invite to Magan and Maxime Schwidler's birthday party on board Le Grand Bleu, which we knew as uh, Eugene Schwidler's yacht. But then obviously we had to prove that this Magan is also the same Magan at the address in New York. So we started back to Google and you know, Google was showing us some third party results of a 23 year old Magan Schwidler in New York who was also at um, Daniel's address. So it was the Bond Street address. So Karina, who's our amazing head of research, had the bright idea to kind of think about it, that if she was 23, she would have to be born, as this suggests, she would have to be born in, um, in 1998. And obviously, according to this birthday party email, her birthday was in August. So what we then did was we went to the New York Voter Registry, which is again public, and it's a really good resource, where you need to be searching by, you know, county, last name, first name, date of birth, and zip code. And obviously, um, we had a lot of this information. The only thing was we didn't know the exact date of birth, um, her exact date of birth. So Karina tried, you know, every single day in August, and it just happened to be the first day, which was uh, <laughs> saved us a lot of time. Um, and from there, we kind of got the confirmation that um, that you know her official registered address was in fact 48 Bond Street, which was obviously the New York. Um, the New York property that Daniel Schwidler owns. Okay, how much time do I have left? Is it okay? Yeah, okay. It's good? Okay. Thank you. Okay. Eight minutes? All right. So, this example is another one from the Russian Asset Tracker. Um, it's about Abramovich's yacht. Um, 
or sorry, one of Abramovich's yachts. Uh, this is the Eclipse. So um, again, so with the Russian asset tracker, what we were trying to do was we were trying to confirm, you know, we were trying to find new assets and we were trying to, you know, catalog their wealth, but we were also trying to confirm with, you know, robust information that assets that had previously been reported were in fact, you know, did in fact belong to people who they had been associated with. But this actually proved to be a lot more difficult than we, um, than we anticipated. So obviously if you just kind of search Eclipse, which is the yacht we were looking at, and Abramovich, you'll see 1.2 million results. So this is literally just the results of Abram Abramovich and Eclipse in the same context. So that was pretty indicative that probably Abramovich is the owner, right? So what did we do? We kind of started looking into the ship. We used the Quasis, which is another free database you can just kind of register with and find, um, find ownership information. And at the time, this told us that the, I think you can see it there. Yeah, that the owner was Kane Global Holdings Limited, which is um, a BVI company. So we had that from the free data, right? So we just, Equasis is free, you can go in. We wanted to confirm it with something, you know, maybe a bit more, well, it's not official, but another kind of source. So we kind of have this paid data, which is IHS data, and you can get it through like Nexus. We didn't, we don't have an IHS subscription, but it does, you can sometimes get it through other means. And basically it showed us the same thing, right? Kane Global Holdings Limited is the um, owner of this yacht. But these two sources are still third party. Like we can't take that to our fact checkers and be like, okay, Abramovich is, I mean, sorry, Kane, Kane Global Holdings Limited is the owner. We kind of had to keep confirming that it definitely was. So what did we do? We bought the very expensive um, register transcript from the Bermuda Shipping Authority. And that was our confirmation. Okay, so Kane Global Holdings Limited is in fact the, um, the owner, the registered owner of, you know, this, uh, this, vessel. So where do we go from there? We went to the BVI registry, which again is just not very useful when you're trying to get um, any useful information. And we just searched for the company. And again, this was kind of almost the dead end. So at that point, we'd, we'd kind of exhausted in terms of, you know, the kind of online and official records. We'd kind of exhausted those, that kind of avenue. So um, we had to kind of get creative and think outside the box. And this is where Again, one of our really, um, really good journalists and, and investigators, Tom, um, had, had a really good idea, which was to kind of turn to human sources. So we, again, we'd exhausted all options. We kind of had to turn to other people who could kind of confirm it for us. So we did the site LinkedIn search. We did Kane Global and Eclipse. So we were looking for people who had maybe worked on the ship, who were associated with the company, or both. And essentially, Tom got in touch with someone who had worked on the, um, who had worked for the company and the ship, and he, you know, he confirmed to him, okay, so as far as all of us on board were concerned, the yacht was RA's, so Roman Abramovich's, and um, you know, that kind of information. So he had confirmed it for us, but more than that, he had actually, uh, the, the person had actually shared with Tom this internal brochure of like guest preferences for people who were using the ship for people who were using the ship and were frequenting the ship. And it was, I mean, if you read it, I mean, this just is something. But it's, um, you know, it will tell you kind of what, you know, so for example, we had Mr. A, so Abramovich, and his kind of preferences that, you know, the pool temperature had to be nine, whatever it was, and he only drinks Evian with, with no ice, but he only drinks fizzy water with ice, you know, that kind of thing. And then we also had, you know, not only that, we had his wife, we had his, um, his close associate, Eugene, who we'd, we've already spoken about. My, <laughs> Dasha's brothers got roasted in this. They, they, they said they only, they have teenage habits. They only eat pizzas, burgers, and, and sausages. Um, and then not only that, it was kind of giving insight into, you know, who else these people were hanging out with. So this is, I think, Boris Yeltsin's um, daughter and her husband. And this was kind of their preferences when they did, did visit the ship, um, the yachts. So again, it kind of took all of that. So at that point, obviously, the, you know, the fact checkers were like, okay, this is kind of probably <laughs> most definitely his. Um, but like to get to that stage, you know, 1.2 million results on Google and we still couldn't really get like, a, you know, a Bermuda transcript or whatever it was saying, 
that, or a BVI document saying Abramovich owns this company. But eventually, you know, we were able to kind of work around it and we were able to add it to our list of assets and confirm that yes, this is, we could, you know, tally it up. So that's pretty much, that's all of the, the case studies. Obviously we went through the horses, which was mostly kind of open sources. We went through the New York flat, which is mostly property records. And then we had Abramovich's yacht, which eventually we had to rely on, on human sources. So that's pretty much. Thank you, Laura. I just want to add that uh, uh, Russian, uh, Russian assets tracker got, won the European Press Prize as the best uh, innovative tool for just doing this research. And I think that the experience of the OCCRP is uh, valuable from both points, from developing of these kind of tools like Aleph that are enabled tracking and searching and, and uh, as well as the Russian tracker and from the cases that they have. So the presentations will be available so you will can then also as, as well as this tip sheet so you will have an ability to download this and use it. Jan, the floor is yours. Um, thank you. That's going to be a hard act to follow. Thank you, Lara. Um, so it's a pleasure to be here. I'm usually stood in front of a room of um, uh, sort of dusty accountants and lawyers, so it's uh, refreshing to look out across a sea of such engaging, inquisitive people. So thanks for having me. Um, as I'm a corporate investigator, I'm usually working in the realms of confidentiality and legal privilege. So. As much as I'd like to stand up here and tell you some sexy war stories about how we cracked cases, um, I'm not really able to do that. So um, I'm going to follow this difficult presentation, uh, or follow this, this difficult um, challenge of trying to be as engaging as Lara was. So I thought I'd approach it in a slightly different way um, and be a little bit more sort of theoretical about um, thinking about asset tracing. Um, so I wanted to sort of cover three real sort of main topics here. Uh, and one, um, sort of knowing your target. I mean, in my world, we're um, working in various different asset tracing um, cases. One, we're investigating governments that have maybe misappropriated assets from our clients. So if we're trying to investigate a government, we're looking at state-owned enterprises, um, revenues from licenses like mobile networks and oil and gas. Um, we might be working for governments, trying to sort of recover stolen assets from a former regime. Um, frequently working um, against corporations. Sometimes they've acted nefariously. Sometimes they're in bankruptcy or insolvency. And frequently we're working against individuals, which could be kleptocrats, um, fraudsters, organized criminals, and commercial debtors. And each one of these sort of targets takes a different sort of approach because there's different assets. As I mentioned with states, you're looking at state-owned enterprises and revenue streams. Uh, corporations, you're often looking at stock as assets or intellectual property or trade receivables or licenses that they may sell. Um, and individuals, we're often looking at the toys that they buy. So yachts, as we've heard, planes, real estate, arts, antiquities, and the rest of it. And all of these sort of just require a little bit of sort of different thinking. So I wanted to just outline that knowing your target is obviously key and knowing the sort of jurisdictional footprint um, is obviously key because it directs you in terms of, as we've heard, what, what available information or, or isn't available. So in certain offshore jurisdictions, you're quite quickly having to turn to the human approach because the uh, sort of opacity of records. I then wanted to sort of, and, and the theme of this know your target will sort of run through the presentation. Next topic is really the asset tracing playing field. I want to touch on asset classes because as, uh, as Lara sort of indicated, each asset has a sort of different way of being owned or used or purchased and it's good to just think about that because it directs you in terms of your information gathering and your investigative techniques. Um, and then knowing the patterns of how assets uh, get or money gets hidden and, and found and I'll focus on that quite sort of heavily. And then it would be remiss of me not to talk about a few sort of sexy investigative technological techniques that we've been using, which I'll come on to at the end, um, to do with geolocation and identifying banking relationships in a legal, legitimate way. 
and also want to talk a little bit about mapping supply chains. Uh, I think Lara noted that we're living in a globalized world, um, which is just underpinned by trade, and there's some such valuable tools and techniques to determine assets in that space. So this is what I hope to cover in the next 20 minutes or so. So the asset classes. Uh, in my world, and uh, it's often sort of lawyer speak, sort of denoting assets in two distinct buckets here. So we've got immovable and movable, and I've sort of defined these um, as common, less common, and occasional in terms of when they pop up in our investigations. Um, I mean, if we start with real estate, um, I mean, it's easy to purchase a piece of real estate, as we know, by obfuscating the ultimate ownership but it's pretty difficult to conceal a piece of real estate. As we've seen in Lara's presentation, identifying it through public records, you might not get the ownership, the, the UBO's name on a property record, um, but you can demonstrate other uh, instances of their use of it or ownership. It's also pretty difficult to maintain a piece of um, high-value real estate without um, leaving footprints elsewhere, visiting it, having maintenance, uh, paying the bills around it. So all of that presents huge opportunities when trying to link real estate to, to your nefarious actor or a debtor. Shareholdings and investments and bonds, that's always pretty easy stuff to dig out. It's usually just good, honest public record analysis. Um, and then on the movable side here, I mean, cash is obviously still king. Bank accounts for us as investigators is, is key to try and get disclosure requests through the lawyers we work with. And bank accounts are uh, not as difficult to identify as some people think, because they're often sitting, banking relationships are sitting in mortgage details to do with um, property ownership. Uh, they often feature in pieces of litigation or online contracts. So there's, there's sleuthing ways to sort of dig that out. And then if we come down to this, this, this bracket here, the occasional art collections, gold diamonds, Bitcoin, planes and boats, We've heard about uh, the sort of uh, the fun of trying to identify the ownership of boats, um, which I won't talk about just yet. But art collections is an interesting one. If you think about someone that's stolen some money and invested in high-value art, you just need to think about the different locations of where information sits. So firstly, who sold the art? They'll know who bought it. Where's the art stored? Storage locations. High-value art is always insured. The insurer always knows where the art is. Um, sometimes it's been loaned to galleries. You can go and speak to the gallery owner. And in some instances, um, art features on the walls of, of people that you're investigating. There may be online profiles in vanity magazines and so forth that you can identify leads such as that. Um, so let's go on to the next slide. So some of you may be familiar with this. This is, uh, you'll get the web address up there, kleptocrat.net. This is a study that we did at the Mintz Group five or six years ago. Um, and we took the World Bank Stolen Asset Recovery Database and identified, I think, about 40 cases of grand stale kleptocracy and basically just chased down the public records, court filings, investigator reports, and media reports and basically put it into a big blender and started to analyze the way in which people had stolen money and hidden it. And unsurprisingly, um, what came out of that was some distinct patterns, which I'm going to sort of talk you through. Um, and we thought the best way to try and um, turn this into a digestible sort of learning tool and some fun, we turned it into an app, which you can download. You can play as the corrupt politician so you've stolen your ill-gotten gains and you've got to stay one step ahead of the sleuths in the room, like yourselves and me. So um, we'll, we'll talk through some of the findings from this here. And this is really the playing field. And we found these five distinct nodes, really. So in the far left-hand corner is the opportunity. Someone needs an opportunity to steal or commit fraud or a grand corrupt scheme. Um, the next node which Lara was alluding to in terms of the network. People always need to, need to trust or involve others when they've stolen something and they need to move it. Uh, in this day and age, you always need a structure, usually an offshore structure. Um, and then the fourth here, you move your money. In, in my world as a former 
law enforcement guy, that would obviously be the money laundering. And then what's the point in stealing money? It wants to come out and play. And this last node here is enjoying your money. So each one of these junctions, there's opportunities for us as, as uh, inquisitive investigators to gather information and try and evidence wrongdoing and asset ownership. Something's wrong. Where's my technical friend at the back? The clicker's not working. <laughs> Better in my brain. Can we have some technical assistance? Bear with us. Yeah. I can talk you through the rest without the slides, but it'll be quite tedious. Trust well, you. While we are waiting, may I ask you a question? Yes. Yeah, uh, you are talking about the, uh, the, second, the second stage, the trustees. As I understand now, actually, these nice guys who we are, who we are tracking to became more clever, and they are not uh, actually registering some property or some assets on the relatives, like uh, mm -hmm. mother-in-law or father-in-law. Uh, how do you find them? And what are the, the uh, tips for the uh, looking for this? circle, close circle of the person in case there is no relatives that you can track or some other like drivers or? I mean, when people are setting off, setting up complex structures um, around the world, they're obviously using um, people outside that initial circle of trust. So often lawyers, accountants, and fiduciaries, and th these are using nominee directors um, and these can feature on repeatedly on corporate structures, so you can see a common pattern sometimes popping up. And people that are further away from the, the, the debtor or the perpetrator often have less um, affiliation and are more likely to cooperate with, with an investigator if at a later point we are approaching them, demonstrating that they've been complicit in a crime, for example. It may be in their better interest to cooperate with us. No problem. So I'll, I'll go on through the slides without the slides. I do apologize. So um, my next point is really sort of no, the, the patterns of how assets get hidden and uncovered. Um, and to, to sort of your question, I mean, mapping out the initial network of people around a perpetrator is key. Family, obviously. <laughs> um, friends, lawyers. In a corrupt bribing situation, you also find that maybe it's the briber that's been involved in helping set up the structure and move money. And over time, the loyalty of people can dissolve somewhat. I mean, if you're looking at a corrupt uh, minister in a, in a state, maybe they've operated with some impunity over many years. There's a change of government, um, and that level of protection um, no longer exists. I've all, we also find that investigating a corrupt official, uh, they feel fairly Teflon in their own country, and they make significant mistakes when setting up structures outside of their country, which we can capitalize on. But the biggest mistake that we see are people uh, involving their family, often their children, adult children, in holding assets. And from a legal perspective, you can then demonstrate fraudulent conveyance, and if you've got a target child in the crosshairs of a legal dispute, it's quite a good point of leverage to um, determine where other assets are held. So mapping, mapping the network is key. Um, for fear of stating the blatantly obvious, I mean, with the, with the borderless world in which we live, um, asset tracing is a difficult sport. Um, it's always cross-border, as we've heard from Lara's presentation. Um, it always involves, in my experience, of connecting um, links between structures um, and individuals and trying to pierce those veils. You can set up a company in an instant. You can move money in an instant. And in my world, where we're trying to recover money for, for people that are either owed it or have lost it through a fraud, 
the element of surprise is also an important point. When a fraudster or a corrupt official knows that the net is starting to, to, to home in on them, they can often start restructuring and moving assets. I mean, there's obviously opportunities there because when assets start moving, you can start to find new structures. There you go. There you go. That's my presentation. Done. Thanks. <laughs> That was the first version of yeah. Jan's presentation. I hope, I hope the translator caught that. <laughs> Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Right. Where did we get to? Uh, I mean, we heard this from, from Lara, so I won't sort of dwell on this too much, but I mean, getting on the debtor's paper trail is sort of absolutely key. Uh, lowest hanging fruit is in publicly available documents, right? More uh, real estate records often identify mortgages and banking relationships, as I said. Customs records, which I'll come on to at the end, really an important wealth of valuable data for us. Um, and then here, we're back to the sort of how to hide dirty money. So I'm looking at time here. I'm not going to spend too much time on this first section. But um, Here's how corrupt officials generally... Um, I have about eight minutes. Sorry? Eight minutes. Eight minutes, okay. Eight minutes. Better go quick. Um, so each one of these is the, the, the opportunity to steal, and I would argue from an investigative perspective, each one of these presents an opportunity to investigate. I mean, if you've steered a contract or you've over, oversold goods to your government, there's often a paper trail and there's people involved in those transactions and contracts that know something that we as investigators and investigative journalists want to identify and talk to. Uh, the hiding, obviously, I've, I've talked a little bit about setting up um, offshore companies. They are key. I mean, cash is still king, right? You still need bank accounts. It never ceases to amaze me how um, easy it seems to be to set up bank accounts where institutions have limited KYC, so know your customer and anti-money laundering. Um, and there's obviously still many jurisdictions in the world that have very low sort of regulatory thresholds which enable this. Um, the moving money, this on the left is one of my sort of favorite, the automatic rewire. I had a case last week which was a client that had, had their finance system hacked into and the uh, payment details on a number of contracts had been changed. They'd paid hundreds of thousands of pounds out settling these, uh, these, these invoices and then they called us and the money had transited through a UK bank. When we got in touch with the financial intelligence unit of the bank, the first response we got was, well, the money had gone because the minute the money had hit the account, it had triggered to, to be sent to another account, another jurisdiction, and then it will move on. So really the challenge of trying to trace money when it can move that quick is obviously hugely challenging. Uh, we talked a little bit about the network. Um, I mean, social media is really our friend these days, right? It doesn't matter how uh, disciplined or sophisticated a fraudster or a criminal or a debtor is. Often their family members and associates will give them away. And we've cracked cases by identifying yachts and property based on posts by family members. I think the travel agent thing here is really interesting. This popped up repeatedly within our kleptocracy study. Uh, travel agents know how to move people around the world and we found that they pop up helping um, kleptocratic officials moving assets around the world. And there's always a corrupt offshore lawyer, which I wouldn't usually say in the conferences that I go to, but I can say it amongst you guys. There's always a bent lawyer somewhere, right? Um, the cover-up, we'll skip through that because time's against us. So here the enjoying. So money wants to come out to play, right? As we've heard about the yacht tracking, the, the airlines. I mean, you'll all be familiar with the brilliant sort of online tools we have for tracking airline uh, private jet movements and yachts. I think some of uh, people have become, uh, what should we say, a, a clued up to the fact that us as investigators are using these tools. You know now that you can set privacy statements or have your lawyers write to some of these websites to limit the availability of information. So how do you get around that? Will you 
um, get friendly with plane spotters and look at the plane spotter websites because they often will upload pictures when a flight lands somewhere and keeping up to date on that on real time if you're trying to track an individual is hugely valuable. Uh, the mansion is again one of my favorite. Real, real estate is one of the most easiest to identify and yet it might be difficult to demonstrate uh, ownership through documentary evidence if a clever structure has been set up. It's very difficult to hide your use of it, particularly when it's a ginormous estate and there's various staff, some of which may have been treated poorly or haven't been paid. Find these people, speak to them. In the Abramovich example with the yacht, which is a perfect example. So how to trace dirty money. And I've given you the sort of playing field of how to think about it. And on this slide here, we just sort of touch on some of the sort of classic mistakes. People are arrogant or they're not very good at asset hiding or people start to move assets when they get a sniff that issues are, are, are brewing. And in, say, a corporate setting where we're looking at a debtor, uh, executives make very poor asset hiders and make huge mistakes that are usually identifiable through the... Through the um, the, the paper trail that you can accumulate. Um, this point here, every last page, I agree strongly with Lara about the, the limitations of the BVI online registry. But I would say in a lot of these places, if you've got a friend that's on the island who can go down to the registry, they can often get more of the filings concerning the, client, the, the target company. The BVI is a good example. Um, we've got huge bundles of, of association, articles of association of companies which have revealed shareholders. Um, Cyprus is another good one. Sometimes if you have someone physically down the registry, there's um, documents which may have been filed which haven't been uploaded, you can get hold of. Um, and all of these sort of offshore locations um, have their vulnerabilities. So if you're looking at a structure and trying to understand why it's been put in place, Find a friendly um, asset protection lawyer or accountant or investigator like ourselves and, and try and work out why someone set up a structure in a certain way. There's often vulnerabilities there. And then we've talked about the network. I mean, this is most of my cases have been cracked by speaking to people, chasing the paper down and then speaking to people. Um, and we work in concentric circles. At the center of the asset holders world, there's the, the, the keys to the kingdom, right? You don't want to go and speak to the corrupt lawyer uh, and the offset. You want to work around the edges. And it's often the secretaries and the chauffeurs. They weren't paid very well. They weren't treated very well. They were exposed to conversations, agendas, and they often hold the keys to, the, to, the, to, to unlocking the asset hiding activity. Then this next point here, beyond the circle, You've got the trusted network, then you've got the next um, surround, which is often sort of nominees and, and other business associates who maybe have put themselves in peril by moving assets or acting in a somewhat illegal fashion. Um, and approaching them in the correct way, you can get them to cooperate. Um, competitors is a very good example. We had that slide about steering corrupt government contracts Obviously, there's usually a tender for these gigantic contracts. I'm working on a case at the moment which is looking at some submarine contracts which were awarded corruptly, and our first step is understanding who were the other participants in that tender that lost out. We're going to go and speak to them. Presumably, they might have been asked to pay a bride or a facilitation um, amount, and they're irked because they lost out on the contract. Uh, again, kids, we sort of mentioned that. Wills and probate, chasing down public records, wills can be a huge treasure trove of assets. Uh, and in some large high net worth families, the squabbling that goes on amongst family members that think they should have had a larger cut of the will can provide vulnerabilities or people you want to speak to to learn more. Uh, how are we doing on time? We've talked a little bit about the, the, the paper trail. The architects is a good one for us. Uh, I've said about someone purchasing a high value property or building a high value property. 
they've done everything they think is wise in terms of avoiding having it linked to them in terms of ownership, but they've surfaced to speak to the architect or the interior designer or the gardener because they want things in a specific way. So there's some people that know who owns that property and it's the same architects, it's also house staff. These people know who have visited the property and uh, as time elapses, the loyalty of people, particularly if they haven't been paid very well or they haven't been treated very well, also dissolves. And then the panic, uh, this is a good one for us. As the net closes in, whatever that might be, a law enforcement investigation, a enforcement of a court judgment, a disclosure order against a fraudster's kids, um, people start to panic and they do stupid things. So keeping a close eye on the network that you've already established about how the assets are held, look for any movements or stupid restructuring steps. Um, also, not this is an expensive endeavor, but surveillance can also be hugely valuable. We were executing a court order to seize some property which was artwork in a, in a palatial garden um, and some horses and some vehicles. So we had surveillance on the property for 24 hours beforehand. You think the debtor had an inside track from the court, so he started to move some of his valued horses, which then enabled us to demonstrate that they were in contempt of court. They changed the vehicle number plates on the high-end vehicles, which again demonstrated they were in contempt of court. And we would tracked where they'd moved the horses to. So I know that's a budgetary constraint probably for your, some of your investigations, but um, where our cases allow it, that's a key step for us. And don't forget the former employees. We've touched on that. Quickly now, supply chains. Um, within the tip sheet, there is a couple of resources um, that are listed that we like a lot. I think some of them are paid, some of them are free. And in this day and age, Supply chains for us is a really important investigative step. This basically is a piece of proprietary software that we have produced, and I'm sure your data scientists will be able to do the same. So this is looking at import-export records to do with oil movements, and the heat map is obviously showing where the oil's going. Uh, but within this data, you can also identify the ships, the companies involved, and also trade receivables. So who owes who money? It's a really powerful strong investigative technique and step. And then finally, as I promised, a couple of technological techniques that we've been using successfully. Um, this first one here is using cellular data, which is sort of aggregated. We've got a, again, in the tip sheet, I think there's a link to the provider of this. And it's basically opt-in data when people download free apps. They never read the terms and conditions. They say okay. And that data can pick up various geolocation data which then sifted and analyzed properly and correlated with what you know about your target in terms of locations like residential addresses and offices. You can sometimes map where those devices have been moving over the last 12 to 18 months. So in a particular case, we were able to triangulate that data, tracking a target, we identified them visiting a uh, private airfield. They then flew to Cayman. They then visited a bank. So from that data, we've got a private aircraft. Cayman Islands is important for their asset structuring, and we know the bank that they now um, are using. The second topic, global banking relationship searches. Some of you may be familiar with this company, Greylist Trace. Um, it's basically taking a target's email address and running an algorithm whereby they're running, uh, sending out packets of data, millions of packets of data uh, across 200,000 banks to determine whether they're getting signals that certain firewalls have been set up to communicate with that email address. Uh, very, it's completely legal, completely ethical, but the results from that can give you an indication of potential banking relationships but also interestingly, the jurisdictions where those banks are, it's down to branch level. It's hugely powerful, pretty uh, economical from a cost perspective. Um, and I'd encourage you to take a look at that website. It's also in the tips and technique sheet. And then this last one, digital asset investigations. Obviously the, uh, the advent of cryptocurrency has 
um, provided a significant asset class for people to move and hide money. Um, blockchain analysis, which I'm not going to go into and describe for those not familiar with it, but the blockchain analysis provides wonderful insight into the way cryptocurrency moves around the world. I mean, you can't do that with traditional fiat currencies. And chain analysis and TRM are two of our favorite uh, databases for that. What the challenge is, is then trying to link crypto wallets to people. Um, and that's probably a topic for a completely another session. Um, but what we've been doing is using this sort of gray list technique against targets email addresses and running it against crypto exchanges to see if we can find links between individuals and crypto exchanges, which then from our perspective potentially provides a sort of target for a disclosure order, for a third party disclosure order through the lawyers we use. Um, and I think I'm on time, yeah. so I'll stop there. Thank you. Yeah.